so we'll keep the program moving along very quickly. Uh, my name is Jim Elliott. I am the current chair of your Prince William Chamber of Commerce. And I also have the honor of being the market president for FEC Bank. So uh, I want to thank you all for being here again today. Uh, I'm going to start out with uh, introducing and recognizing some of our VIPs that are present here today. We have our Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, Dr. Daniel Carey. The Governor's Chief of Staff, Clark Mercer. Our Chief Workforce Development Advisor, Megan Healy. And then the Majority Caucus Chairman, Delegate Tim Hugo, is here. And Senator Jeremy Pike. Delegate John Bell, perhaps We have Supervisor Marty Noe from the Coles District. We have Supervisor Janine Lawson, right up front. And I know Supervisor John Jenkins is due to be here. Has John arrived yet? He's on his way. Okay. We also have the uh, City of Manassas Park Mayor, Jeanette Rochelle. <laughs> Town of Occoquan Mayor-elect, Ernie Porta. Ernie? <laughs> the City of Manassas Councilman, Ken Elston. Ken? <laughs> we also have from the City of Manassas, Councilman Ian Lovejoy, right up front. City of Manassas Councilman Mark Wolf. We have the Prince William School Board Vice Chair, uh, Leslie, I'm sorry, Lily, sorry, Lily Jesse. Lily? I see you back there. Do I see Dr. McGorick sitting there right in front of me? Dr. McGorick from City of Manassas Public Schools. We also have Chairman of the Pakistani American Business Association, Mr. Sadiq Sheikh. See? Thank you. Thank you. Have I missed anybody? I'm sorry? Okay. Sorry. Uh, now, if you are a past chair of our Chamber of Commerce, please raise your hand and be acknowledged. Wow. Yeah, wow. Of course, we need to recognize our president and CEO of our Chamber of Commerce, Ms. Debbie Jones. <laughs> current board members, if you are a current board member of our chair, uh, Chamber of Commerce, please raise your hand. <laughs> and we have our Commonwealth sponsor, Potomac and Rappahannock Transportation Commission. University, Government and Community Relations. Of course, we also have here filming us today, uh, What's Up Prince William? He's right over here to my left, so if you don't want to be on camera, avoid that side of the room, and uh, you won't be part of the program. So, thank you, Steve, for uh, videotaping us today. Now, George Mason University Government Relations is our locale sponsor. I'd like to introduce Dr. Rick Davis to come forward and say a few words. Rick. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Rick Davis, I have the privilege of being the executive director of the Hilton Performing Arts Center as well as the dean of our College of Visual and Performing Arts under whose umbrella this center resides. And it's a great privilege to welcome you to the Hilton, to the Science and Technology Campus here, and to the Gregory Family Theater in which we sit. And, and on that occasion, I just want to pause for one brief moment uh, and remember John Gregory, who donated the, the money for this theater 
in memory of his family. This is the Gregory Family Theater. Many of us know that, that John passed uh, away on Monday at age 96 after a long and distinguished uh, life of service in so many ways. Uh, and he was a great, great supporter of all things um, Manassas, Prince William, uh, and certainly here at the Hilton Center. So since we are in John's house, I just wanted to take a moment and, and thank John uh, and in the presence of all of you to, to remember that, that great servant. So thank you, Mr. Gregory, uh, and fare thee well. Now, an overview of this place would take three hours, and I understand I only have one hour, um, so, so I'll, I'll be brief. But the Hilton Center has been here for eight years, and we have served over 800,000 people already. Uh, we have a motto here that is the Arts Create Community, and today is an example of the Arts Creating Community. It's an example of public-private partnership that is truly transformative and unique in the annals of American civic vision. The county, the city, and the university coming together to create this shining jewel that is both a symbol and an agent of positive change in this region. Like the Freedom Center on the other end of campus, like all of the research and teaching that's going on on this campus, the Hilton Center represents the best of what can happen when people work together. We have about uh, 2,200 students coming to this campus every day for one kind of study or another. That number is projected to double and even a little more than double in the next five years. About 5,000 undergraduate and graduate students will be coming here in the next five years. That will create all kinds of additional vitality and life on this campus. That will create the need for more housing, that will create more restaurant traffic, that will create a lot more patrons for the Hilton Center. So we are absolutely delighted by the growth that is happening right here on your science and technology campus. Bull Run Hall is going to double in size. We have the Volgeno School of Engineering bringing new programs to complement their already strong offerings, mechanical engineering, bioengineering. We have the Virginia Series Game Institute, part of our college, uh, just down the street here. Uh, and supporting that growth, of course, is the, uh, I want you to just imagine, before I leave the stage here, the aerial snapshot of this region, maybe 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, and now you can all do this in your mind, a time-lapse photo from 3,000 feet right over the Hilton Center and imagine what has happened and what is happening and what will happen in the next three to five years here as the stake in the ground that the Science and Technology Campus represents has led to this beautiful growth and flourishing of intellectual, artistic, cultural, and civic life right here in Manassas and Prince William County. So thank you for your part in doing that. Welcome to the Hilton. And now it's a privilege to introduce Dr. Angel Cabrera, the president of George Mason University. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Dr. Davis, for uh, giving me, I guess, 55 minutes of your allocated hour, <laughs> which I'm going to use to uh, deliver a lecture to you. Which I, you're on a college campus. You cannot walk out without a lecture. If you were to take a lecture from any of our brilliant economists about economic development, about economic growth, and ask them what really drives economic growth, they'll say, well, you know, there's some, there's some basic stuff that you have to have. Right? You have to have some physical infrastructure, you have to have roads and trains and airports. That, so, uh, you, we have all that stuff in English. And, and the stuff that is not working too well in transportation is being addressed. And thank you to one of our sponsors for taking care of I-66. Great job. So the other thing you need is you need a business-friendly culture. Because government does great things, but it's not known for generating wealth. It is businesses that, that generate wealth. So you need to have a business-friendly culture. I think we can give ourselves a big check on that as well. In Virginia has demonstrated to be a, a, a business friendly uh, location. So what else do you need? Because things are getting very uh, complicated, very competitive around the world. We're now competing not just with the city next door or the state next door, we're competing with places around the world. So, well, there are two absolutely essential things in the 21st century. Talent and ideas. Talent and ideas. And as it turns out, uh, you, you need the talent because uh, in, in the 21st century, all industries rely on knowledge. You need people that are very well trained, they know how to learn, they know how to improve their skills, and you need to have ideas to figure out what is going to be the next wave of products that are going to be bought and sold uh, throughout the world. Universities happen to, have the, happen to be the best invention we have developed that just at the heart of that, of talent and ideas, that's, that's the best thing we got. In fact, we, have, we do some uh, research at Mason every year that shows a very strong correlation 
between how many world-class research universities a region has or a, or a country has and the competitiveness of that region. And it's an extraordinary correlation. It's in the 60, 70%. The more, given your size, the more top research universities a region has, the more competitive that region is, um, is, is going to be. So here's what we're trying to do at George Mason. George Mason happens to be uh, probably the biggest investment the Commonwealth of Virginia has made in Northern Virginia to make sure that this region continues to be the driver of our economy. So we're taking our role very, very seriously. So what are we doing around time? Well, the first thing we've done is become the largest university in the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth is telling us we need more graduates. We're not producing as many graduates as our economy needs. We're on board. Uh, over the last decade, uh, George Mason has produce half of the entire growth in enrollments in the Commonwealth. One institution has been responsible for half of the entire growth of enrollments. Last year alone, thank you, thank you, thank you. Last year alone, and I know this sounds crazy, we added a thousand students. Half of those students, by the way, in engineering. We're right now the biggest producer of uh, graduates in IT, we have about 5,000 students only in IT and computer science. We have about 2,500 students in data science and analytics. And so we need to produce more talent. Probably the most exciting thing we're doing, and, and we're delighted, by the way, that the governor appointed a cabinet level person uh, to deal with the issue of talent. And, and she heard all about this, and she's now a big fan of our program. We're working on this incredible partnership with NOVA. NOVA happens to be uh, one of the largest community colleges in the country. Um, who said second? <laughs> okay, the second largest uh, community college, but the very best community college. Yes. So we have we, we have we have one of the one of the strongest partnerships between a community college and a, and a four-year. Uh, um, uh, institution in the country. Uh, every year we have about 3,000, we have more students who come to Mason uh, from a, a community college than we do from, from high school. We're very proud of that. And we're working on a program called Advance to make sure that the pipeline is as efficient as possible. The no talent is wasted because there are cracks in the self system and the people don't find their way to get in their degree. We're taking that very, very seriously. We appreciate the, the support uh, from the current administration and I think we're, we're gonna make you all very, very proud of that. And, and a big focus of that program is gonna be in IT and cybersecurity and the, and, and, and the medical services and, and the biotechnology, all the areas that we know are strategic for the future of the economy. So, so that's what we're doing on the talent side. But there is another side which is equally important, which is ideas. I mean, we need a new wave of entrepreneurs coming up with the next crazy idea, the next product, the next service, the next technology. And that's where universities also play a huge role. Not all universities, but research universities. Research universities like ours, which two years ago was classified as a research one university. There are only 115 research one universities in the country. Now, we used to have three in Virginia, now we have four. George Mason is the youngest research one university in the country. It's essential that we keep feeding that. A lot of the work that happens on this campus around cancer research, proteomics, new diagnostic tools, in game design, in, in IT and other areas, turns into, um, into spin-offs, into businesses that are creating jobs that are really enriching and diversifying uh, the economy. So just in the space of cybersecurity, for example, which has been identified by the administration and scholars and researchers as really one of those industries that are going to be pushing our, our industry and our economy going forward, in that space alone, thanks to investments um, in research, we've been able to win a competitive uh, process last year with the Department of Homeland Security. It's a 40 plus million dollars, it's a 10 year program. We now have one of only nine centers of excellence for the Federal Department of Homeland Security. Only one of nine centers of excellence in Virginia. We beat out amazing research universities. Why did we win them? We win that process, other than because we were brilliant and we're great at it. Because the Commonwealth is making very strategic investments. Last week, Governor Northam, announced 
a new wave of grants given uh, by the Commonwealth through uh, CIT, the Center for Innovative Technologies. You may have seen among those there was a, uh, a significant grant given to George Mason University for an eminent scholar in cybersecurity. The way that works is that money allows Mason to go and compete to bring not just one eminent scholar in cybersecurity, but to bring that person in with a research team to outfit a lab, to provide the equipment to that person, so then that person can compete for the big grants from federal agencies and bring that next $40 million, $100 million uh, university-affiliated research center uh, to, to our campus. That's how that works. So these investments are absolutely, absolutely essential. In the, uh, the budget that uh, the governor will hopefully uh, sign uh, this afternoon, we never, we never know, we never know. Uh, we never know. Uh, that perhaps he will sign this afternoon. Uh, there, there are some very important investments and I need to thank him and all the elected officials for all the work. I know it hasn't been easy, but in that budget, there are very important things that are going to affect our campus and our region. Uh, there is a $21 million investment to expand one of our facilities here to accommodate this crazy growth in engineering at George Mason University. I told you about half of the thousand students that we're adding are in engineering. We cannot accommodate that without this investment. Uh, there are going to be investments in some of the other campuses. There are investments in, in um, in research, there are investments to help us deal with the growth in financial aid. There are, um, there are investments that are allowing us to serve many more students, to eliminate some of the barriers to access. So there's a lot of important stuff. And I want to thank, uh, really, the, the administration, governor, uh, the elected officials, because really those investments are making a difference. Not just a difference in our university, but in the ability of the university to continue to be the motor, the engine that drives the, the economy in, um, in this region. So thank you so much. Thank you, Governor, uh, for being with us today. Thank you, all, all of you. And I hope, again, this, this uh, story of economic growth is a team sport. It's not an individual sport. It takes all players. It takes the government, government of the state to do its thing. It takes uh, the federal government, hopefully, to do its thing. It takes local government to do its thing. And it, it takes entities like George Mason to also uh, pull their way. So we're ready to do our part. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you, Dr. Cabrera. And thank you for hosting us here at this beautiful venue here today. This is an amazing place to be. So now we have our speaker sponsor. Our speaker sponsor is Maggie Gill. She is the CEO of Novant Health, UVA Health System. So Maggie, would you like to come to the podium, please? It is my great pleasure to be here today with fellow Prince William Chamber members and to represent Novi Health UVA Health System. Today is a big day and um, health care is one of the crucial issues of our time. Um, it is the fabric, part of the fabric of society. It touches everyone, everyone in this room, your families, um, and something that you count on will be there, something that you, you count on that will be there at the moments in your life when you need it. It's a basic human need. It's a vital community asset. And when you think about growth and business development, it's part of that infrastructure framework that you need to be able to grow talent and bring big ideas and, um, and create a thriving economy and uh, a healthy community. So the Virginia General Assembly's decision to support Medicaid expansion um, and the courage of our governor is very important and will lead the way in terms of providing care um, from hundreds of thousands of people in our state who don't have it today. It is an important step forward in lifting up care for all. Um, and that's exactly what we do at Novant Health UVA Health System. Our mission is to improve the health of a community one person at a time. And so this is where I get to tell you a little bit about us um, because I get that question a lot. So what is Novant Health UVA? We're a not-for-profit partnership. Um, we have a strong managing partner, Novant Health, who's based in North Carolina, and of course the University of Virginia, which is a local and trusted partner in Virginia. So um, this is a new venture. We've been together about two years, 
and um, we're a network of community health providers. So we're at Prince William, Haymarket, Culpeper. We have three acute facilities. We have um, 25 different medical group locations. We have many, many outpatient centers. And we're about keeping people healthy. We're about wellness. We're about community medicine. And um, we're here for you. For a large employer in Prince William County, um, we employ about 2,300 team members, um, and we have 850 volunteers, which I think is just outstanding that we have people who come every day um, because they want to give back. And that's, I think that's sort of the nature of healthcare is that people are drawn to it and they want to give back. Um, we contribute to our communities in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, we give to charitable organizations. Um, we provide um, community benefit um, to people who don't have the ability to pay. In fact, I will share with you this statistic that one in ten patients at Prince William Medical Center does not have the ability to pay for the care that's provided. Now that's a pretty stunning number. And so that's why expanding access to care and getting people engaged in their health care is going to really improve everything in our community. Um, so last year, our community benefit totaled $83 million. So that's what we as a not-for-profit gave back. And we'll continue to do that. We also make capital investments. Um, the modernization of Prince William Medical Center will have our grand opening next week is a multi-year $38 million facility improvement project designed to increase patient care services and access to care and the environment in which we care for our patients. Last month, I'm happy to say that we received approval for a second cardiac catheterization lab at Prince William Medical Center, so we're growing our cardiology services, um, which is providing more life-saving care to our community. And, um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of improvements that we've made and a lot of progress we've made improving the quality of care overall. And so this is where I get to brag a little bit and share some of that with you. Prince William has joined an elite group of 95 hospitals across the country who've received an award from the American College of Cardiology for the treatment of people with um, coronary artery disease. So um, we are, again, we're here to take care of you and prevent you from having um, an event in your life where you need surgery or other types of intervention, so caring for your heart. Um, we are also earned the American Heart Association and American Stroke Association's Get With the Guidelines Stroke Honor Roll Plus, I have to look at it because it's a long one, and Heart Failure Goal Plus Achievement Awards. Um, so it matters to us because having these third-party validations of the quality of care we, we provide um, is evidence to, to our patients, to our community, um, that we're going to give you the best care possible should you need us to take care of you. We're also a magnet designated hospital, which means we're recognized for excellence in nursing care. Um, and we have joint commission gold seals of approval for a variety of surgeries, including joint replacements. The short version of this story is we're here to serve you, our community. We're here to grow with you. Um, we are an exciting partnership of community medicine, academic medicine, and, um, and we're going to continue to grow. Um, so to, as today's speaker sponsor, I have the great privilege of introducing our governor. We all know that Governor Northam has a long list of accomplishments acquired over a very impressive career. And I, I was told that he doesn't like the whole list read, and he's just giving me the, giving me the yes, that's right. <laughs> but I just want to say how much I admire him as a physician taking care of veterans and children, two of our most needy populations. Um, and so I think that his track record as a professional and his track record of service and I for one am really glad to have a doctor as our governor so um, thank you governor for being here and let's give our governor a warm warm welcome much for the, the kind introduction and I, I appreciate you keeping the, the introduction brief so uh, people can continue to enjoy their delicious lunches and uh, it's just a, a great opportunity to be here and I just uh, you know what I would call just another sleepy day in Richmond today so, so it, was, it was good to get out for a little while and, and get some fresh air but it's great to be with the chamber and I just want to thank you all for all that you do to drive our economy in Virginia I was just talking to some of the the members a little bit earlier that you know Barry Duval is a 
a good friend of ours, and I, I've obviously in contact with him a lot. And just the, the way that the chamber has grown over the past few years is just amazing. And it is, it's just such an, an economic driver. And to have businesses participate, uh, and, and you know, it is small businesses, startups that are really the backbone of our economy. So, so we really thank all that the chamber does. I, I know that we have a lot of elected officials here today. Um, and I'm not going to go through the, the list uh, again, but I just wanted to thank you all for your public service. And I would remind folks that this is perhaps not the easiest time to be a public servant, but I, I really believe it's the most important time. And we have tremendous challenges, and, and I don't know about you, but I am so proud to be a Virginian, and I, I believe that we live in the best commonwealth and the best country in this world. And so I, so I thank all of those that that uh, have chosen to serve the public and, and uh, really appreciate your, your efforts. I, I, it is always, President Cabrera, to, great to be back on the campus of George Mason and just what, what you all have done up here, your vision and, and really helping to train individuals for the 21st century jobs. Uh, I commend you. Uh, you know, he was talking to me earlier and, and the, uh, he wanted to know if I had uh, made arrangements or plans to sign the budget. I said, well, President, I'm still, you know, kind of dotting some I's and crossing some T's. And he said, would you mind if I added a couple zeros here? And there? <laughs> but, um, not today. <laughs> um, but thank you. For, uh, for your hospitality here, and it is always wonderful to, to see you. So, so thank you for that. And, you know, to talk about what is on the agenda, we will be leaving here in a little while and, and traveling back to, to Richmond and, and signing a, a two-year budget, a, a biennial budget for the Commonwealth of Virginia that did take bipartisan support, and I, I'm proud of the budget, and I believe it's a budget that is good for, for all Virginians. It is a budget that is structurally sound, it is a budget that protects our AAA bond rating, which is just so important uh, because we do rely on bonds. And uh, after the signature today, we will have close to a billion dollars in our reserve, our rainy day fund, and, and that's something that is certainly very important to our rating agencies. And it's, it's also a, a budget that is something that, as a physician, I have felt very strongly about, and I suspect a lot of other people across the Commonwealth have as well, but it will increase access to close to 400,000 working Virginians that today don't have access to, to health care. And so I think that that's something that we can all be proud of. And again, I, I really do believe that it's a budget that is that it's good for Virginia. You know, I'll, I'll have a little trivia quiz here. And there was a man, uh, he uh, actually spent a lot of time in Virginia. He said, without health, there can be no happiness. Um, and I certainly agree with that as a physician, but I know some folks at this table know, but anybody know where that quote came from? Thomas Jefferson, that is right. So, uh, uh, so it is important for people to have their health, and uh, now you can add one zero, how about that? <laughs> the other thing regarding our budget that I, I remind people of is that there are consequences to limited resources. And we should always take advantage, you know, whether you agree with the Affordable Care Act or not, when there is money on the table, and in this case, millions of dollars, and uh, you could argue billions of dollars, uh, we just, from a business perspective, cannot continue to, to give that money to, to other states who, by the way, we compete with. So, so hopefully we will be able to complete that later today. A lot of people um, ask me, um, what, a couple questions. One, what is it like to be governor? Uh, what's it like to live in the governor's mansion? And you know, I would tell you that it's a tremendous privilege, but uh, we got off to a little bit of a rocky start. And you know, on inauguration day, uh, it was exciting. It was, for those of you that were there, it was very, very cold. I couldn't do anything about that, but uh, uh, we, we got through that. And then we had a, the inaugural ball, uh, which was a lot of fun. And, you know, at the end of the day, Pam and I were kind of tired and wanted to get some rest. And so they escorted us to uh, what was our new home. It's actually your home. And by the way, I hope you can come visit uh, in Richmond. Our, our doors are always open. They took us into their, our bedroom. And 
When we walked in the bedroom, there on the bed were two pillowcases uh, with large pictures of Governor Terry McCullough. And, and they said, set on them, sleep when you're dead. Well, <laughs> I want you all to know, and you can tell him when you see him, I slept well on my pillow um, to spite him. Um, my wife actually uh, put hers, disposed, whatever language you want to use, uh, in, a, in another area. And, and then we, we finally settled in, and I guess it was about 11 o'clock, he had set the stereo system to go off at, at top volume with some hard rock songs. I, and I, I didn't know where the stereo was. Anyway, it took a little while before I got that under control. <laughs> Finally got to sleep, and then at 3 o'clock in the morning, the first of several alarm clocks. Uh, so, so anyway, needless to say, we had taken care of that, and now we're, we're ready to do the business of the, the Commonwealth. But, the second question, on a more serious note, is what do I want to do as the 73rd governor? And it's, it's actually very simple, and, and that is that it wasn't that long ago that Virginia was the number one state in which to do business. And for a number of reasons, we fell off of that position, and, and I won't go through all those reasons, but two years ago, we were at 13th. Uh, last year, we were at 6th, but I believe that if we work together, um, and especially with the business community, we can certainly get back to, to being number one in the country. So, so that is uh, what we're, uh, that's what our main priority is. I am, I am pleased to tell you today uh, that our unemployment rate in Virginia uh, is at 3.3%. It's the lowest it's been in over 10 years. And, and while that is good and while that's encouraging, that also presents some challenges uh, as well that, that we're well aware of. And, and I wanted to talk just briefly, if I could, about a couple of challenges I see with our economy. The first is that here in Northern Virginia, uh, in Hampton Roads or the Southwest or the Eastern Shore where I'm from, we have always been fairly dependent on, on one or two industries. Here in Northern Virginia, we're very dependent on the military and government contracting, and we always will be. But no region in Virginia should be solely dependent on one industry. So, so with some urgency, I really believe that we need to diversify our economy. And, and when we talk about how to do that, uh, it all boils down to workforce development, which I will come back to in just a second. The other challenge, and is, um, I don't want to regress too much, but uh, you can probably tell I'm not from Northern Virginia. Um, but actually, I have a lot of friends here, and Jeremy, I, I, I'm going to tell this story very quickly. Um, during, the, during the campaign, uh, I spent a lot of time in Northern Virginia. Matter of fact, Seth, who's with me somewhere, we pretty much lived uh, up in Northern Virginia. And one day, someone came to me and said, Ralph, why are you spending so much time in Northern Virginia? And I said, because I can camp. And so, <laughs> so the, the rest is, is history. But the point I was going to make is that I'm not from Northern Virginia, but I am from a very rural part. Of Virginia. I grew up on Virginia's Eastern Shore. As a matter of fact, it's that little piece of Virginia that they often leave off the map. And I can promise you that if you go to the Eastern Shore of Virginia or the South Side of Virginia or the Southwest of Virginia, the unemployment rate is nowhere near 3.3%. So in order to lift up all of Virginia, we really have to help rural Virginia. And one of my pet peeves and and a project of mine, and, and it's great to see the legislators, and I know you all are committed to this as well, but is, is universal broadband. There is no excuse in 2018 that there are so many pockets across this great commonwealth that don't have access to broadband. And if you think about it, what business in 2018 can grow if they don't have access to the internet? Uh, and as far as education goes, you know, children work on computers at school well, if they go home at night with an assignment and don't have access to the internet, their hands are really tied. So, so rural Virginia is, is something that we'll continue to work on that's very important to me. Back to workforce development, and, and uh, Angel, you, you mentioned 
uh, some of these things. But I think the first thing that we need to do when we talk about the economy and, and how we train individuals for 21st century jobs, first of all, we have to identify what those jobs are. And they're really, a, you've heard of STEM. Uh, I add a couple of letters if that's all right. I call it STEAM H, but science, technology, engineering, the arts, math, and healthcare. So jobs like cybersecurity, unmanned aerial systems, biotechnology, artificial intelligence, data collection, data analysis, these are the jobs of the 21st century. So we have to work together when I say we, our agencies, the education systems, and the business community, and talk about how we can train these individuals, how we can keep our colleges and universities affordable for all Virginians so that they can all live the American dream. How we can get past on hell the stigma that I believe my wife and I are just as guilty as other folks, but it's almost like if our children don't go to a four-year college or university such as the Virginia Military Institute, that they're not going to be successful. <laughs> I'm just seeing if you all are still awake. <laughs> But the reality, <laughs> that's why I got these colors today. I mean, <laughs> I've got the green tie to out in the truck. So. <laughs> but, but the reality is that these are, it's not really blue collar or white collar jobs anymore. These, these are new collar jobs. And so you don't necessarily have to have a, a four year education. So we really need to look at how we can promote our community colleges. And we have 23 great community colleges how we can look at apprenticeships, how we can even at the high school level put more emphasis on vocational and technical training. So, so workforce development, if you want to help grow businesses in Virginia and also attract new businesses to Virginia, we have got to be able to train the 21st century workforce. So, so that is, is very important. I wanted to mention transportation briefly and, and thank the legislators and Tim, I know you, you worked hard on this, but Metro is just vitally important to uh, Virginia. It's vitally important to the economy in Northern Virginia. And Virginia took the lead this year. We, we, we know there have been some issues, some challenges with Metro, and a lot of those, Ray LaHood, I think, has done a, a good job in, in helping to deal with some of those. But we, we never have had really a dedicated source of revenue. And so Virginia took the lead this year. Um, and uh, in the budget is $154 million uh, per year. It's part of $500 million. It is a combination from Virginia, Maryland, and Washington to finally support Metro financially. And so I think that's a big goal. And, I, and we're proud that, that Virginia took the lead and, and Maryland and, and, and Washington, D.C. Have, have followed. Another area just briefly I want to mention is, is energy. Um, if you're going to attract especially large uh, businesses uh, to Virginia to, to go to our mega sites that we have set up. Competitive energy is very important, so uh, we want to make sure that we have prices that we can compete with other states. And one of our goals, and I, I think this is a reality, is that, and this is important by the way to businesses as well, that, that we really push and move into the direction of renewable energy. So there's a tremendous amount of potential across Virginia to pursue both solar and wind. Uh, I just met with some folks yesterday in Charlottesville that have a wind project that's starting in Botetourt County. Dominion is going to put two trial turbines off of our coast. And, and so I would like by 2030 to have at least 30% or more of our energy that we generate in, in Virginia to come from renewable energy. And I, I think that is certainly something that is very doable. And, and you certainly can't flip a switch overnight, but I think we as a society need to try to wean ourselves away from, from fossil fuels in the upcoming years. The, the last thing that I just wanted to mention is it is something that I can promise you when businesses talk to us about coming to Virginia, and it's something that I heard a lot uh, when I campaigned across the state uh, in 2017, and that is that we live in a very diverse society. And our society is becoming more diverse every day. And it's really the diversity of our society that, that makes us who we are in Virginia. And it makes us who we are as Americans. And so uh, as long as I have anything to do with it, it won't matter to me the color of your skin. It doesn't matter the country that you come from or the religion 
that you practice. We are going to be inclusive in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Our lights are going to be on, our doors open. We're going to welcome people to Virginia. So let's move forward in, in an inclusive manner. So in closing, uh, thank you for what you do as a chamber. Um, again, uh, jobs are the most important thing in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Every, every Virginian should have a job that they can support themselves and their families with. It doesn't matter who they are or where in Virginia they are. And if we work together, we can make that happen. So uh, it is a tremendous privilege to serve as your 73rd governor, now that I'm finally getting a little bit of sleep at night. Uh, but, but I look forward to working with you. Our doors are open. Uh, nobody in Richmond, uh, especially me, has a monopoly on ideas. So your ideas and, and thoughts are always welcome. And, and please come visit us if you're uh, in Richmond. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day. side of the decimal point, the zero goes, and he gets that shot, so, but uh, somebody can tell him that later. So, at any rate, wow, that was great. Uh, we're very pleased that the governor was able to come here today. Uh, we should give him another round of applause, but he's not here, so. And make sure he gets on that plane and gets back to Richmond in time. That's what we want. So, now, I'd like to recognize our Economic Development Series sponsors here today. We have Walsh, Kalushi, Lubali, and Walsh right up front. We have R.W. Murray and Company, and we have the Fauquier Bank. Now, on behalf of the Fauquier Bank, I'd like to invite Gary Jones. He's the chair of our Economic Development Committee here at our chamber. He's also Senior Commercial Relationship Manager for the Fauquier Bank. Gary, come on up and say a few words. Good afternoon. Good to see you all. Uh, again, we appreciate the governor taking time out of the schedule to come here and address us today and share his thoughts. 172 to 3. 172 to 3. Uh, as Jim said, I'm Gary Jones with Falkier Bank. I run our commercial and business banking team here in Prince William County. I'm on the board of the chamber and I chair our economic development committee. Falkier Bank's been around for over 115 years. We're connected and ingrained in the business community. That's how we started and we remain so today. Like most of you in this room, we understand the best way to compete and differentiate ourselves in today's competitive business economy is by finding a way to differentiate from your competitors. And you don't do that necessarily by relegating yourself to becoming a commodity, by being the cheapest product on the market. At Falkier Bank, we genuinely believe that the best way to do business is through relationship. If relationship matters, people matter. Uh, we believe you need to be able to add tangible value to the people that you work with, to your clients, to your centers of influence, and even to your prospects. 172 to 3. According to 2015 North America Digital Banking Survey conducted by Accenture, there are 172 digital banking transactions conducted for every three in-person interactions. Again, at Falkier, we believe you've got to do business person to person. Face to face matters. You need to, you need to understand the people you work with. As business owners, you want to work with people that you know, that you trust, that you know you can rely on. Again, people matter. It's just not the black and white of your financial statements. Jim and I are lenders. Primarily, we do other things. And that's one thing that we always have to do when we convey to the back office decision makers or to our boards, is our people our clients are not just the black and white on the paper, there's color and context, and we need to be able to add that. We do that over time and through relationship. So I'd ask you, 172 to 3, who are your three interactions going to be with? Thank you.
Thank you, Gary. Now, our vision partners. But before I recognize our vision partners, I also want to recognize someone else who's here in the room today, and that is our chair-elect, Betty Dean, right up front. And many of you who came to our chairman's ball last Friday night, the new board was installed, and Betty will be taking over as our chair on July 1st. Uh, I will no longer be chair after the 30th, and I'm actually going to miss it very much. I've had a great time, and uh, I'm going to miss doing this, and, uh, but I've enjoyed it. But Betty, I'm going to give you a round of applause. <laughs> Uh, our body of work wouldn't be possible without our chamber partners, of course, and we have our vision partners, and I'm going to start out, our advocacy partner is Transurban, and their motto is giving travelers new choices for faster travel throughout Northern Virginia through the 95 and 495 express lanes. Our business growth partner, Apple Federal Credit Union, improving lives and fulfilling dreams. Our education partner is Dominion Energy. Celebrating and supporting education from early childhood, K through 12, higher ed, and adult continuing education throughout the Commonwealth and beyond. Our healthy community partner is Sintera Northern Virginia Medical Center. We improve health every day. Our quality of life partner is Ziders Enterprises, a quality of life company providing individual and family support, mission expertise to military, veterans, and federal customers. Our economic Development partner is I-66 Express Mobility Partners, transforming Northern Virginia's Main Street. And on that, I'd like to invite Javier Gutierrez from I-66 Express Mobility Partners up to the podium here for a moment as I'm gonna give him his plaque. And as we've been on a very tight line, Javier chose not to speak today. So uh, thank you for that. <laughs> see. And of course, our Cornerstone, 2017-2018 Cornerstone and Keystone Partners. These members have chosen uh, to partner with the Chamber to showcase their commitment to impacting the community and developing a reputation as your preferred partners in success. Their logos have been shown behind me on the scrolling screen. They're also on the banners on either side of the stage. So thank you for that. Uh, let's give all of them a round of applause. Now, our up and coming events. We have on June 26th from 8.30 until 12.30 at the Manassas Park Community Center, our government contracting matchmaking event. If you've never been, you should go. If you're a government contractor, it's important if you want to do business with the government or if you want to work with the government contractors. That's a good event to go to. We have a lot of primes that'll be there displaying their wares and talking about what they do. And uh, so that will be a good event if you'd like to go. That's again on June 26th from 8.30 until 12.30 at the Manassas Park Community Center. Then, uh, let's see. Learning about any of the 2018-2019 annual partnerships, stop to see Debbie. So if you'd like to be a partner and be announced at one of these functions, you can come up and see Debbie. We have opportunities available in that as well. Uh, we also have uh, Connect At this Friday over at Potomac Mills Mall. I think we're gonna be at Saks Fifth Avenue entrance over on that side. So if you'd like to come, that is at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, tonight, after hours at Westminster. And for those of you that are leadership Prince William, we also have the annual meeting for that. And that'll be, I'll be at that, I won't be at that, <laughs> sorry. But now, special thanks. Okay, special thanks, yes. The, uh, our series sponsor again, Walsh, Bush, and Lubali, and Walsh, the Fauquier Bank and R.W. Murray. And how about a good round of applause for the food today from Georgetown Catering. Oh, you can't leave without having dessert. So you might not have known it, but there is dessert on the table back there. So tiramisu. So I think maybe you might want to grab some and take it on your way out the door or just sit and stay a while and enjoy. You don't have to get back to work yet. Um, we also want to thank the Hill Performing Arts Center for hosting us here today. And of course, thank all of you for being here. Thank What's Up Prince William. And now our door prize. We have two tickets to our GovCon Matchmaker event. So if you've got your business card in here. Michael Kalish from Walsh Collision Live Alive Walsh. 
again. Thank you all for being here today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.